So good morning. Are we all really, really exhausted because it's been two to three, and now this is day four of some really good learning, some networking. I know by the time as staff we get to this day, we're just pushing through. We love it, but it's, it's a lot um, in a good way. I am Courtney Nordrum, so I, can everyone hear me okay? So I work for HCCA and SCCE. I was the social media manager until I got promoted and then I hired a new social media manager. So this means that I know a whole heck of a lot about social media. And that comes from being interested. I'm an extrovert, I like talking to people. Social media lets me talk to people even when I'm not face to face. And that's one of the things I really like. If you're an introvert, don't freak out because it also means that you can communicate with people without having to get out of your pajamas, which is a really fun thing. So this morning we're gonna kind of do it in three parts. We're gonna do what I like to call a primer on social media. What are the platforms? What are they used for? Kind of the best practices on who, what, where, why, when for social media. Second part is gonna be the meat of the regulations. It's gonna be the danger zone. Here's all of the things you need to pay attention to and be wary of in your own social media and for the social media of your employees, the people that you are hoping to help be compliant and ethical. Third part, and this is the part that no one has presented on before, so I'm hoping I do a good job, is how do you use social media to promote your compliance program? So, when we get started, we're gonna do standard disclaimers. I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. This means none of this is legal advice. Please don't take it as such. There's no legal advice in this presentation. I'm also an HCCA employee. Nothing I say today is coming from the HCCA, it's all coming from Courtney. These are not the views of HCCA, not that they're offensive, because they're not, or any of the leadership. These are the disclosures, have to put them there. So. This is a really, really, really good quote. And I think that when I said it to my mom, who's very not social media savvy, my mom still has a flip phone. She doesn't text, but she loves Facebook. And I said this quote to her and she went, yes. So in 2005, Facebook didn't exist for most people. It was invite only at colleges. Twitter was a sound you might hear. The cloud was something in the sky. 3G was a parking space. Applications were what you sent to colleges, and Skype was a typo. So in 10 years, in one decade, that's how far we've come. And this is just on technology and social media. Obviously, we've come farther in many other ways, but this kind of puts it all in perspective. And Thomas Friedman said that. What is social media? Social media is a whole heck of a lot of things, but these are kind of what I call the big five in the middle, your social networks. And so that's what most people think of when they think of social media. Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn. Here's people connecting to other people via the computer. That's what most people think of. Now people are starting to think of pictures and videos. So that's Tumblr, that is Flickr, that is Pinterest and Instagram. Video, YouTube, Vimeo, these are big video. Those are all social media. Blogs and streams we call social media as well. So if you read, write, follow any blogs or streams, that's social media. And then finally, reviews and ratings. Yelp, Amazon, TripAdvisor, all social. Why should you care? There's power in numbers. Chances are your friends are on it your employees are on it, and your clients, customers, and patients are using it. So if that's not enough, then you're probably not gonna get a ton of interest in this session. Because basically everyone's on social media in some fashion. If you've ever written an Amazon review, you're on social media, you just don't know it. Another big reason you should care about social media is it's a great way to send, receive, send and receive information. 
People are searching for information. People want it. By using social media proactively, it's a really good way to give them the information you want to give, make sure it's quality information, and you can establish yourself as a re resource. They'll keep coming back. Google cares. Google now cares about social media. It took about eight years, but if you search for something, it's going to bring up social media results, usually before anything else. If you Google my name, you're gonna get my LinkedIn profile. Then you're gonna see my really boring Facebook, and maybe if you're lucky, my Twitter. That's what's gonna come up. The article I wrote for the newspaper in 2003 is gonna be buried on page 47 because Google cares about social media. There's credibility in it now. Surprising stat number one, more than 40% of consumers say that they make purchases and deal with their health through social media, 40%. So people are looking on Facebook, your potential patients your doctors are out there on these social media channels and people are finding information and choosing where to go and what to do with their own health from those channels. 60% of doctors say that social media helps improve the care they give. Many doctors have boards where similar to HCCA net like we have for compliance professionals. Many of them have boards where they go and they ask questions. They don't reveal patient information, but they say, hypothetically, if these symptoms were attached to a person who's 50 years old, diabetic, and six foot nine, what would you think was going on? And they get feedback from other medical professionals. That's helping them do their jobs and be better doctors. Number three, 30% of adults are sharing information about social media or about their health on social media. My cousin just posted yesterday his wristband from the emergency room. He fell and broke his arm, he was skateboarding. He posts this on social media. All of you are going, eek, HIPAA. He can post his own information, so I'm not worried about that. But if you're my age, I'll be 34 one week from today, all of your friends are on social media and all of them are posting about every cough, every sneeze. Um, when their babies are born, they're posting all of the information there. Doctor's appointments, ER visits, you're seeing it everywhere. And so it's become important for the medical profession and the compliance profession to realize kind of the gravity of social media and that it's not just for teenagers taking pictures of their food. If you're sitting here, you have a social media strategy. If you're sitting anywhere else in this building, you have a social media strategy. I'm gonna walk through here because I wanted it more forward, didn't happen. Even if your strategy is, eek, I'm not doing anything, don't talk to me about social media, that's a strategy. You're avoiding it. Everything from social media guru point, posting 40 times a day, Frank Arellis, if many of you know him, he is a social media crazy person. He's out there all the time. He's adding to the conversation. That to, I'm just gonna take a nap because the thought of it exhausts me. All of these are strategies. Let's talk about the channels. So when I say channels, I mean the different social media sites. Facebook. I put it first, not because it's the most important, but because it's the most ubiquitous. Everyone is at least heard of Facebook. How many of you have a Facebook? The majority of you. The majority of the world now has a Facebook. There are people who don't have running water who have Facebook accounts. <laughs> Facebook is huge for photo sharing. So what I did is I grabbed my own screen grabs for every one of these. So any of these things know that they're mine and that there's no information being given out that shouldn't be. Photo sharing, I was in London three weeks ago. There's a Polish Mexican bistro in London. My first thought is, I need to put this on Facebook. <laughs> My friends have to see this because it's funny. Eight people commented and my mom wanted to know what the menu looked like. Like there was no actual informational value there except here guys, this is funny, let me smile and take a picture. 
Facebook is, however, really good for groups. We have a group on Facebook. HCCA is its own group on Facebook. You can see the lovely dolphin. Whatever building we're in right now, I think it's the dolphin, <laughs> um, was our background because we put our ad up there for the CI. This is a really good way to stay connected with HCCA. It's also a really good way to get news. So we are posting news articles every day up there. We also post a lot of pictures from our events. If you attend regionals, academies, this event, we're always taking pictures and we're gonna post them up there so you can see them, take them, tag your friends. Events, same picture in the background. Sorry, every time I move my left arm, my mic makes angry sounds. Same picture in the background. This was an event specifically for the Compliance Institute. So I said, I set up an event page. Here are all the details. Here's the link where you can register. Who's coming? 135 people joined that event. That's 135 people who through Facebook said either I'm registered, I'm going, or I wanna go, I need the information, I want the updates. And chat. These are all my friends. They're fine with being up there. Top one's my husband. Chat with him all the time on Facebook. Super easy. You type. Done. Hit enter. Done. My mom, who doesn't text, has figured out Facebook chat. She is a complete introvert. If she doesn't want to talk to somebody, she doesn't want to answer her phone, she will still Facebook chat me. Did you bring a sweater? Yes, mom. I brought a sweater. It's 90 degrees and humid but I brought a sweater. <laughs> LinkedIn. Who has a LinkedIn? Yay. LinkedIn has now become the most professional of the social media channels. If you're not on LinkedIn, um, I hope you're not looking for a job because that's where they're going to find you these days. It's also really, really good for Google. If you want Google to find you, create a LinkedIn account because Google knows that it's actually got some credibility, it's business, there's very few offensive things posted on LinkedIn, so it pushes it right to the top. Someone Googles your name, they're gonna see your LinkedIn account. Basically, LinkedIn is interactive business cards. This is mine, I have boring lawyer hair in this picture. I apologize. <laughs> um, sometimes I have to look like a real person instead of a fun person. You go on there, you put who you are, what you do, and anything else you would put from your resume. Generally, you want a professional picture up there. You don't want there to be drinks. You don't want it to be a party photo. You want it to be essentially a headshot. On LinkedIn, they've recently added you can share your projects and your goals. So this is a great way to let people know what you're working on now and what you want to work in in the future. This is basically to get a job or for people to find you, for recruiters to find you. But it's also a nice way to keep a resume, air quotes, updated without going into Microsoft Word and updating it all the time. You can go take three minutes and put in what you're working on and then you have it there. So in four years, when you want to actually update your resume, you'll have all of your projects and the goals and all of the kind of things you did along the way. You can network in groups. This is our HCCA Facebook group. That's Stephanie, our new social media manager. You've probably seen her walking around as well. She's also the captain of the blog, which we'll get to. Networking in groups is great. We've got 21,000 people in our HCCA group. Every week, we get 147 about discussion posts and comments. These are people finding articles, asking questions, connecting with your peers to share information, opinions, and best practices. It's easy, it doesn't take a lot of time, you don't have to do a lot of in-depth reading. Read through headlines. What went on today that I should care about? Also now, in the last year, LinkedIn has started what they call their kind of writing program. They're not really calling it blogging, but it is blogging. I stole this picture from Roy, our CEO. 
he's the captain of writing 400 words and hitting send. So he's been doing that quite a bit. They started it with just a select few people. Now everyone can write on LinkedIn. If you have something to say, you can write it on LinkedIn and it's going to post in the feeds of everyone you're connected with. And you can post it in the groups if you're members of groups. Google, again, Google is loving this. So if you're trying to show up and be established as credible in any capacity, Google is going to find you if you start writing on LinkedIn. Twitter. Twitter is the one when I'm at the tweet up for all of our national events, everyone says, why should I care about Twitter? Nobody cares what I have to say. I don't care what anyone else has to say. Fair enough, and that may be the case. So the big thing about Twitter is you can follow others. For HCCA, for our official social media, we follow about 400 Twitter accounts. I don't wanna say people because they're not necessarily people. Those are the 400 Twitter accounts that I have found to be the most valuable for providing news, resources, and smart things that they say. You can also search hashtags. So this is a really kind of Debbie Downer example, but it is the best example that I can think of because it really shows the power of Twitter. During the Boston bombings, when they caught the two gentlemen, well, one gentleman that they caught, the one that was um, not so lucky as to be caught, all of that was happening on Twitter before it was happening on the news. So if you searched on the hashtag, and I'll say a hashtag is what we used to call a number sign. And when I do it, I do this. If you watched Jimmy, Kim, Jimmy Fallon, hashtag, it's the number sign. It's the pound sign. If you put that in front of any key words or any subjects that you want to search on, it's going to find everything that's been tagged with that. So if you searched on the hashtag Boston bombings during that time, you were getting essentially live updates from the ground, very grassroots. There was someone who was across the street from where the gentleman was arrested who was tweeting exactly what was happening every minute. The press didn't have that kind of access. The police aren't sharing it. There's no helicopters overhead because they restricted the airspace. But on Twitter, you're seeing it every couple of seconds. Another really good example, last year during our conference, the ICD-10 delay was passed. Within three minutes, I was able to search on ICD-10, find a legislative aide who tweeted about it, tweet it to our entire conference, and get a message to Roy and Adam that said ICD-10 delay has passed. You can let everyone know. And fewer than five minutes from when it happened in Washington to where we were in San Diego, that information had spread. It is the best resource, and I'm not exaggerating, the best resource for news if you want timely, up-to-the-minute updates. Join the conversation. So joining the conversation basically just means saying what you're doing. Twitter is very limited. They call it a microblog. You get 140 characters, and that includes spaces. You can join the conversation by posting anything you want. Good examples are all of our Twitter boards out here. Anyone who posts and puts the hashtag HCCACI is running on our Twitter feed. I've been posting a little bit because I don't want to necessarily see myself up here all the time. But one of the posts you'll see is Gabe the dog. So Gabe was Justin's dog. Um, Justin spoke Monday morning a lot of pictures of Gabe. People loved Gabe because A, he's adorable, and B, he's a dog, and you don't see dogs at conferences very often. So we have been seeing a lot of pictures of Gabe the dog. I started the hashtag Gabe the dog because I thought it was cute. So that's one way to join the conversation. People also post a lot about where they are. I'm at the Vikings game. Now you're all feeling sorry for me because I went to a Vikings game. I'm at... <coughs> San Francisco Giants game, whatever. That way your friends know where you are and anyone else who's at the same place now sees that you're there too. Not that it matters, you're not probably gonna connect and have a beer, but it's just a way for us extroverts to share where we are and what we're doing. 
You can also retweet. Retweet just means that you take a tweet you saw and post it on your account. Very basic, but it's also kind of a thumbs up to the person who tweeted it. In Twitter world, retweet is what you're looking for. How many retweets did we get? How many times was that retweeted? I don't have a picture of it because I think there was some issue with grabbing the picture. I didn't grab it for a reason. Of the Oscars, Ellen DeGeneres had a picture of like 12 really, really famous people in one picture from the Oscars and they took a selfie, which just means they turned their phone backwards and all smiled and took a picture. That basically broke the internet. It was retweeted something like three million times that night. So now Ellen's people and all of the people who are in that picture know they're super popular and everyone loves them and they can use that for marketing purposes. Little time out here. A lot of this is gonna sound marketing e. That's on purpose. I know you're compliance officers, I know you're probably not marketers, but as compliance officers, you have to market your compliance program. I market social media. I also used to market myself as an attorney. It's not a bad word. It's just a way of letting people know who you are, what you offer, and what you can do for them. Time in, back to social media. SlideShare, who here has heard of SlideShare? No one. Let me tell you about SlideShare. It's the best resource, you're gonna love it, and everyone's gonna give me a hug when they leave. SlideShare is 130 million PowerPoint presentations. Someone decided, because they're really, really smart, that they wanted to share all of their PowerPoint presentations with the world. And they got some buddies together, and they put them together as SlideShare. There's now 130 million of them. You can search by name, subject, organization, anything you want, you can put in the SlideShare box. This morning I searched for Medicare. 34,000 PowerPoint presentations came up. ICD-10, 11,000 PowerPoint presentations came up. This is why you should care. PowerPoints are the distilled information you want. It's not the white paper, it's not the academic journal, and it sure as heck isn't legislation that's coming from Congress that no one, including the Congress people, want to read. It's the distilled 10, 20 top points that you want to know and need to know about information. You can download the PowerPoint presentations in PowerPoint on SlideShare. It's not just a printout of PDFs, you get the actual PowerPoints. And part of having a SlideShare channel is that you control how much information people want. As HCCA, we have over a thousand slides up. Every single slideshow from last year's Compliance Institute is up on SlideShare. This year, in the next few weeks, every single slideshow from this year is going to be put up on SlideShare. It is the best resource you're going to find for PowerPoint presentations. Steal them. It's not stealing because when they put them up there, they're agreeing that they want to share them with you. They're giving you permission to use their slides, to use their ideas. Take it. Take advantage of it, because it's awesome. And I'm gonna take a drink, sorry guys. Share. So if you come up with an awesome PowerPoint presentation, in the corporate world we used to call them decks. If you come up with an awesome deck, you can share it. Say, you know what, I think a lot of people could gain some value from this information. Take out all the information you don't wanna share, put it up on SlideShare. It's going to be a, helping your peers, but B, building your credibility. Really good way to become an expert on something, air quote expert, because I'm a social media expert because I put that after my name once. So yeah, that's exactly what, how I became a social media expert. I decided I was an expert. So it's a really good way to build, build credibility and get people to know that you understand what the heck you're talking about. Tag. So this is an important aspect of SlideShare. You can tag. 
and you can't see it here because it's really small. I asked for a screen like this big and they didn't give it to me. Your slideshow is going to pull in your entire presentation verbatim, every word, and it's going to do a transcript. You can also add tags. When we put them up there, we put our name, the name of any speakers. This is what another way for Google to find it. So you say, yeah, all of these words in this PowerPoint are great. What is it actually about? That's what you're going to do. You're going to tag it. That's how people are going to find it on the meta level. Meta, meta is kind of the underground, not seeing it on the face level. Analytics. This is a really cool part. So when promoting your own programs, you're going to want to know what's working and what's not working. At least I would. So with that, you're going to want analytics. Has anyone ever clicked on this? Am I wasting my time? Or alternatively, 10,000 people have downloaded this. Apparently, I've got some good stuff. This is just valuable information to help you move forward and tailor your program, and most importantly, not waste your time. Pinterest. So everyone sees Pinterest and they think of weddings, crafts, and recipes. Uh, I swear, I don't know how anyone planned a wedding without Pinterest. I got married 10 years ago. I didn't have Pinterest. Now I want to replan about 40 weddings because of all of the cool things that I see on there. So Pinterest is for pinning. This is basically the internet equivalent of magazine tear sheets, of going through a magazine and tearing out the pages you like. That is what Pinterest was based on. You pin things, which is basically putting a thumbtack on a board. You pin things you like. This is a joke. That's OK. It means that at least you're connected to people. <laughs> this is a really funny joke, but you can't see it because the pin was on top. It's a knock knock joke. Knock knock. HIPAA. I can't tell you that. Ha ha ha. Funny joke, right? I pinned it to our HCCA pin board, and it went crazy. People loved it. There were like 11,000 hits on it that day. And it was a Friday afternoon. So apparently it was more popular there than it was here. <laughs> when you pin things, you put them on boards. You can't really see it, but this is our ICD-10 board. Boards are just groups that you can label. I have one for HIPAA, I have one for the ACA, I have one for ICD-10, and then I have like, we call it the lighter side. Funny compliance jokes because everyone needs to take the time to laugh a little bit. My goodness, laugh a little bit. What we pin and what's good to pin are visual things. Infographics. Do you guys know what infographics are? Infographics are when you take any sort of information or data and you make it pretty. Yesterday on your chairs, hopefully you saw an infographic about certification. One in two people at this conference are certified. It was that one. It had Florida and California. You, pretty fonts, pretty numbers, lots of colors. Those are infographics. And that's mostly what we're pinning on Pinterest. It's a visual tool, so we want to use it in a visual way. Important key thing for social media. Use the tools how they're supposed to be used. Pinterest is visual. Don't pin text on Pinterest because no one cares and no one's going to go there. Facebook, visual. Twitter, kind of visual, mostly text, all about hashtags. So when you're looking and you're thinking, not only in your own personal lives, but in your professional lives, of any social media you want to use, any part you want to take advantage of, Think about the media, how it's used, and how it should be used. You do not want to use Pinterest for something that you would put on Twitter. You're going to lose credibility, and you're going to turn everyone away from you. And it's just no good. Following. So these are two little clips at the bottom of every board. There's a follow button. You can say, when I log into Pinterest, I want to see everything HCCA has posted. That's going to come up in your feed. So when you log in, it's everything you're going to see. 
I will tell you, the Mayo Clinic has an awesome Pinterest. If you are a hospital, a clinic, if you are doing outreach on that kind of level, it is a fantastic resource. Go into Pinterest. You don't even have to create an account. Search for the Mayo Clinic. They've got 40 boards. They've got boards for diabetes, gastroenterology, heart disease, families of sick people, the Ronald McDonald House. They've got them all. And it's just filled with resources. They've done a brilliant job of providing really, really good information in a really digestible format. And maps. This is what we use Pinterest for the most at HCCA. Pinterest has a mapping capability. And for all of our national conferences, so everything that we do in this kind of format. So we've got our managed care, clinical practice, the Enforcement Institute, all have map boards. And you can see this is Orlando. Well, you might be able to see this is Orlando. What I did is I went through and I Googled, what the heck can people do in Orlando? And about 50 million things came up. So I went through and I said, these are adults. What do adults want to do in Orlando? Okay, where is this stuff located? I pinned our hotel, I pinned this location, and then I said, I want things within two miles of this location. There wasn't much. As you know, we're kind of on a little, I call it Epcot Island out here. I'm sure Disney has a very lovely trademark named for it. Then I went five miles, and by the time I got to five miles, there were like a thousand things to do. So I went through and I read some reviews, and I pinned the top 100 things I think people would find interesting near us. I did restaurants, attractions, uh, there's an outlet mall on there, and they're just a nice resource to have if you're leaving kind of this campus. If you're not leaving this campus, ignore our Pinterest board because it's not gonna be of any value. But if you say, you know what, I'm gonna get in a taxi, I'm willing to spend $16 on a cab ride, then you've got 100 plus things to do, see, and experience all on our board. Every one of them is clicked to a link to that website. It's gonna show you exactly where it is on the map. And I've written a description. Why the heck should you care about X, Y, and Z? Blue Zoo, which is in this restaurant, is super highly rated by someone who has called themselves an expert. I put that description in there as well. It's just another resource and another way to give tools to the people who are looking at your stuff. Instagram. Instagram is not super important from a professional standpoint. Instagram is for pictures, and it's joked about it's mostly for pictures of food. I'll be honest, I mostly post pictures of food because I'm a terrible photographer. Any of my other pictures look terrible and no one wants to see them. I do post pictures of my dogs. So if you find me on Instagram, you're gonna see a lot of pictures of dogs because I'm that person. So it's for photos, it's a photo sharing website. However, you can add filters. So Instagram has their own filters. You can make things black and white. You can add all of these different tints. You can add words. Just play with your pictures. Still not adding a lot of value, but interesting and fun. Hashtags. Instagram also works on the hashtag kind of system. Hashtags are subject index. If you're looking for a particular subject, you search on a hashtag. I searched for Minneapolis, because that's where I live. 895,901 posts. That many pictures have been tagged with just the hashtag Minneapolis. And video. You can add video now to Instagram. You can get a whole 15 seconds of video of your kid on whatever that's called. I forget what it's called um, because I fell off of one when I was a kid and it's been blocked out from my memory since then. YouTube. YouTube is to watch videos. So we have the YouTube channel called Compliance Videos. Not only do we put our promotional videos up there, we put 
what we call expert videos. We take all of the people we think are experts and who are willing to talk to us on camera, and we post them on YouTube. What do you think the most important aspects of a compliance officer are? All right, let's get you to talk about that on camera, and we're gonna post it, and we're gonna put it out there, and everyone can watch it and hopefully gain a little. Creating a channel, so this is our channel. We share it with SCCE, that's our sister organization. That's for corporate compliance. We only have one YouTube channel because of a lot of different reasons, but there's one. So don't get scared when you see corporate compliance along with healthcare compliance. We put them both in the same place. Everybody wants the seven elements and that's what we're talking about, so we're sharing a channel. A channel just means you've created an account. So every single account on YouTube, as soon as you post a video on it, it's going to give you a channel. Share. So you have a million ways to share things on YouTube. If you can see right here, these are all of your share buttons. It'll even give you a piece of code to put in your blog. It is a really, really easy way to get video out there to the world. I will tell you, if you want to share video, make it less than three minutes. We will sit and I will play on social media all day because it's what they pay me to do, not because I'm bad. But if you send me a YouTube video longer than three minutes, my first thought is, I don't have time for that because that's kind of how YouTube works. And monitor. This is Inspector General Levinson from last year's Compliance Institute. I hope you recognize him. You can see when we posted it, Boom, this was the beginning of April. When people started ramping up and getting really excited about the Compliance Institute this year, oh, all of a sudden we really care what Inspector General Levinson had to say last year about things. We're catching up. We're kind of cramming for the test, if the test is the Compliance Institute. Again, another way to monitor if what you're doing is working or if you're actually connecting with people. Google Plus, how many people are on Google Plus? How many people actually are on there consistently and post regularly? No one. Google knows this. They've completely removed all of their staff from Google Plus. There's nobody who works on it on the back end because they realized it was never gonna take off. Google is great at a whole heck of a lot of things, social media, not one of them. This is one of the few times in this presentation I'm gonna tell you, don't bother. Don't get a Google Plus. Don't even bother going on there and getting any of that. It's not gonna benefit you. Anything else you get on Google Plus, you can get on the internet in general. Google does have something called Hangouts, which may be useful. And if you're interested in hearing about Google Hangouts, come find me. But Google Plus is basically taking its last breath. And other dot, dot, dot. So other includes kind of the entire rest of the internet. We have our own site called HDCA Net. I labeled it as a discussion group. So basically what we did is we put a listserv online. Everybody remember listservs where you would join and then you get 10,000 emails a day and you'd filter for the four that you actually cared to read? Now you do that in a social media group. Makes your inbox less obnoxious so you can get more emails from Sheridan about how you can save 20% this weekend. Discussion groups are a great resource for really targeted things. This is all compliance people. This is compliance and ethics officers in healthcare. That is a really good resource. Like I spoke about earlier, physicians are also doing the same thing. They're going onto their boards and getting help from their peers. They're not perfect, much like we're not perfect. Social news. Show of hands, who knows what Reddit is? Okay, I do because I'm married to the biggest nerd on the planet. Social news. Is, Reddit is a really good example. People post news and then the group decides what's important and what's not. Reddit calls itself the front page of the internet, and it is a really good resource, but it's also very clicky and kind of weird. 
It's very kind of nerd specific. And nerd is, nerd is not derogatory when I say it. It's coming from a place of love. But they have their own language. <laughs> We talk about the seven elements. We talk about HIPAA, ICD-10, ACA, OIG, CMS. Nerds have their own language too. Reddit is full of nerds, but it's also a really good place to see what's important in news and what's kind of working for other people. I believe there's like 13 million people or something on Reddit. It's more than in the state of Minnesota. So if you're looking for kind of what's important to the general populace, that's gonna be out there. This is one no one ever thinks of. Caring Bridge is social media. It's a social media support group. I know probably 15 people who have posted or posted for a family member a page on Caring Bridge. It's a way for people to connect. When you boil it all down, social media is a tool for people to connect and feel connected. Like, I'm going back to my mom, and she would be mortified if she knew, but my mom hates people. She hates going out and just being with people. She likes to live in her house in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin on like 40 acres. She doesn't even like it when the mailman comes. Her husband's a lucky man. Um, so she can still feel connected without leaving her house. She's not now what we call a hobbit or any of that. She's not hiding in a hole anymore because she can connect with the world and the universe from her house. And blogs. This is our blog. This is Adam, our VP, smiling. Blogs are social media too, and they kind of get overlooked. Commenting on a blog is at the very base, social media. Reading a blog, you're putting it out there for someone to read it and for someone to kind of care. The rules. This is the scary part. We have a ton of regulations. HIPAA. So HIPAA is kind of the biggest and baddest of the rules when it comes to social media. And for this entire rules part, I want you to think not only in your personal life, but for your employees and for any kind of professional branding you're doing as well. So it kind of goes across the board. HIPAA, security and privacy of PHI, ePHI, breach notification. High tech, ePHI, security and privacy, breach notification, and then we said, you know what? It's not enough that you do it for yourselves. You need to do it for everyone you pay to work for you too. All of your contractors, all of your business associates, you're responsible to some extent for what they're doing as well. The NLRB. I know it doesn't apply to everyone, but I will guarantee you it applies to most of you. NLRB is where the most people get in trouble on social media. They are crazy in their decisions right now on social media. <coughs> they have cracked down, and we'll talk about it more in detail, but it's definitely something you wanna be aware of. The FTC. Whoever thought that you were going to have to think about the FTC when you're doing medical healthcare compliance? Well, if you're touching social, touching social media, you need to think about it, because they're watching. The FTC is basically looking for your endorsement, <coughs> testimonial, and anything your employees are saying if they're, not, if they're not disclosing their employees and they're endorsing, that's gonna be an issue for them. State laws. Because the federal laws aren't enough, you now have your state laws. That can get into a whole ball of wax that I don't even know about. I know state laws in Minnesota, and that's about it. But wherever you are, and if you're using social media from a professional perspective, you need to know the state laws where basically everyone is. Does that sound scary enough? The IRS. The IRS is watching too, because political activity. Oh, we thought just one was scary. Oh, that's interesting. Apparently I'm not as expert at PowerPoint as I am on social media. ACA, record retention. ERISA, record retention. 
Equal employment laws. Again, you're gonna have to be very, very careful where this stuff comes up. And I'm gonna go through examples of all of these, so don't think I'm just talking about social media and going, here's some laws, blah, 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 follow them. No, I'm gonna walk you through some examples. IP laws, copyright infringement. Whoever thinks of that? The AMA, they have their own principles. So if you have medical professionals who are posting on behalf of your organizations, they have to follow their AMA principles. And internal policies. So anything that your organizations are choosing to regulate is also going to have to actually be monitored and regulated. HIPAA. Oh, HIPAA. So not only am I a social media person, I am a CHC. So I do understand HIPAA, and I've got a pretty good working knowledge of how it applies to social media. So HIPAA violations. Any disclosures made on social media with PHI, any patient's PHI, is a violation unless you've gotten a signed form, a disclosure form, a waiver, whatever you're calling it, unless you have one, you can't post their information. Oh man, that's no fun. Not only are you working with HIPAA as general, you've got the privacy rule, you've got your security rule, your enforcement rule, omnibus rule, and high tech. Privacy, security, enforcement, omnibus, high tech. Oh, here's HIPAA, now we have to follow all of this. We have to make sure we're on top of all of this just for HIPAA, which is one tenth of the regulations and rules we need to follow. Potential HIPAA violation scenarios. Now we're talking fun stuff. A patient tries to friend their physician on Facebook. Boom, bad idea. Peds nurse is posting pictures of babies in the nursery. Oh, it's cute and innocent. Look, their feet and toes and they're so small and cute. Yeah, guess what? That's a bad idea. Don't do it. Don't let them do it. Lab tech is blogging on his personal blog and says, oh, my equipment's terrible, it's unreliable. They should have bought me new equipment years ago. Uh-oh, now we have a problem. This is one of my favorites because this is one that people don't think about. One of your marketing people is monitoring your social media. A patient goes absolutely crazy saying how terrible your organization is. They almost killed her mother. They almost killed her. It was the worst. The doctors don't know what they're talking about. The nurses are incompetent. Someone insulted her. The marketing rep goes on there and says, nah, -uh, we're great. We're awesome. We have five stars. And the doctors did their best, whatever. As soon as that marketing rep goes on there, they've confirmed that they were seen at that organization's hospital, clinic, etc. Boom, HIPAA violation. And this is one that actually happened. Medical students, medical students, they don't always think so far through their decisions, particularly when it comes to social media. Medical students are now younger than me, which is a little scary, but it means that they've grown up with social media part of who they are, it's the language they speak, it's second nature to them. They don't even think twice about posting things. Well, a guy came in, he had a shark, or he was attacked by a shark. He was missing several limbs. There were five medical students that took pictures of him and put it on Facebook, and then emailed them to friends. Not so hard to find the guy who got bitten by a shark on the news figure out which hospital. Yep. I kind of have a, I think the issue of your number, the third one with the, uh, the uh, lab tech. Yep. It, it may not even be a HIPAA violation, but if you're going to run into NLRB issues if you restrict this speech from talking about his, uh, his frustration with his employees in prison. Potentially, yes. That's an awesome catch. That is why I labeled these potential HIPAA right. violations. This is my lawyer speak right here. I'll get my giant hair out of the way. Potential. So that is a potential and that is kind of the diciest one when it comes to social media. You are gonna have to be careful, but if he's blogging and he says, I work at 
I think my example was Nordrum Northeast, because now I own a hospital, apparently. And none of our equipment works, and we're the worst, and we're killing people left, right, and center. Well, that could be a potential HIPAA issue. You're going to have to be careful when it comes to NLRB. Yep, that guy posting on Facebook, let's assume he's one of your doctors. Let's assume he's one of your medical students. You basically have no recourse for this. NLRB is going to protect it. So it's going to apply. Like I said, it's not going to apply to everyone. It's going to apply to most private sector's employees. This is going to be universities and healthcare facilities. So if you fall into those two buckets and a bunch of other ones, the NLRB is watching you. You may not be able to tell your employees not to discuss drinking benders, strip clubs, or anything that's perfectly 100% legal outside of work on their social media. Kind of the most you can do is ask them not to say that they're your employees. Concerted activity, this is kind of the big guy when it comes to the NLRB. They want to protect everyone's ability to talk about their working conditions, their wages, kind of gripe in general about work. And the NLRB has been militant about cracking down. I will tell you, in the last two years, if you even Google it or come talk to me, hundreds of decisions have come out saying basically, you don't get to limit what they say. Be very careful. So NLRB is comparing it to a virtual water cooler. They're saying anything your employees would say around the water cooler, we're going to protect if they say online. That is a very, very wide net. Be cautious when it comes to NLRB decisions. And this is a stock photo, meaning you can go on a stock photo site and buy that picture, because I did. Weird, right? Harassment issues. Your employees are going to talk to and about each other on social media. It's going to happen. You need to be aware of harassment issues. It comes in a lot of different forms. 62% of people who say that they've been harassed online have been harassed on Facebook. I don't know what the criteria was for being harassed, but I would guess it's someone saying someone hurt my feelings. So 62% of the people being harassed online are on Facebook. You would think it would be on some other general media, which I'll talk about in one second, but it's not. Email, 20% of people say they're harassed via email. I don't know necessarily how one harasses via email, except plain outspoken, but 20% of people are identifying as being harassed via email and Snapchat. So Snapchat is not a social media I talked about because it's not professional. There's absolutely no reason any of you should build a Snapchat account for your organizations. Please don't. It has a terrible reputation, it gets a lot of teenagers in trouble, and it's a breeding ground for bad decisions. All of this being said, only 5% of people saying they're being harassed on Snapchat. Blows my mind. Snapchat lets people take naked pictures of each other and send them. It's the only social media that lets people do that, and only 5% of people find that harassing. When people are being harassed online, 44% of the time it's sexual harassment. 28% of the time, professional character. This means that 28% of the time, those who have identified as being harassed think that someone is insulting their ability to do their jobs. That's not cool. And randomly, 13% think people are being harassed in a classist manner. This again falls into the bucket of, I don't know what that means, but I thought it was an interesting statistic that 13% of people identified that as how they were being harassed. IP issues. So, intellectual property, the copyright. Yeah? So, what do you do about the harassment? Monitor it. So, under the NLRB, your employees have the ability 
to kind of gripe generally. They have the ability to talk about conditions and wages and all of the kind of generic things about work. They do not have the right to harass others or be defamatory. So if you're monitoring harassment, if it comes up as an issue, you look to your policies to see what you do for harassment generally internally. It's just, I threw it in here because it happens a lot, especially, and this is gonna be a little not politically correct, especially with women. Women can get very, very catty online. And when they do, they take it out on Facebook. And some of them post pictures of the people that they don't like and talk about why they don't like that person's haircut. That's not gonna be protected under the NRRB. Good? IP issues. So when you're doing social media and you have someone, ah, not all of my stuff came up there, and you have someone posting on your behalf, you need to be careful of intellectual property issues. In addition to everything else, if you're gonna be posting pictures, they can't just go to Google image search, search for something, and then put it in social media. You have to pay for pictures. There are stock photo sites. You have to make sure you have the rights to everything you're posting. A really good example of this is on HCCA Net. We let anyone post documents. We say, if you wanna share your documents with us, we would love to have them. But before you do so, you have to promise, pinky swear, and check a box that you own the copyright to this document and that you are giving, have been given permission to post it. If someone emails us and they're angry panda about their documents being online, I get an email directly into my inbox. I'm also our IP kind of liaison. And they are generally saying, please remove this, I own it, cease and desist, blah, 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 lawyer talk, we're mad. That is the DMCA part of it. So if you're posting basically anything that's not yours, you're gonna need a DMCA takedown notice. DMCA is the Digital Millennial Copyright Act. If you're posting anything that's not yours, you're going to need a link to an actual live email address that goes to an actual live person in your organization named person that says basically this person's gonna take it down as soon as they get that email. That's how you're protected from copyright issues generally. So if someone steals a document, they steal a social media policy, upload it to HCCA net. That's a big deal. However, if the person or organization from whom that was stolen finds out and clicks, please remove on the website, I'm going to get that email and I'm gonna take it down right away. This is now required to cover your tush for copyright if you're posting things that aren't yours. The IRS everyone's favorite government organization. So the IRS issues really only come into play if your organization is tax exempt. Tax exempt organizations have to be really, really, really careful, particularly on their social media, about endorsing any candidates, campaigns, doing any lobbying, or any sort of employee participation. There have to be a lot of very specific disclosures made and a lot of very careful thought going into any kind of posting. The IRS would love to take away your tax exempt status for violating one of these. FTC. FTC, most people don't think about it as an issue, like I said earlier. This is an example of how you're gonna run into an FTC issue. Nordrum North is the best heart hospital in Minnesota. One in three patients die at the generic heart center. That was just tweeted to 20,000 followers. The person who tweeted it didn't disclose that they work for Nordrum North. We'll say it's my husband. That guy can be my husband. That's Noah. He just tweeted to 20,000 people a lie, essentially, and didn't say that he worked for our, our hospital. Northern North is not the best heart hospital, mostly because it doesn't exist. <laughs> Data about generic heart center is false, completely made it up. 
And then it was retweeted by our official Nordrum North Twitter, which does not exist as far as I know, to another 20,000 followers. The FTC is gonna hate you for this. You've just broken all the rules. You didn't disclose that there was an employee. You tweeted something that was false. There was all sorts of horrible things going on here. So if you're having employees tweet through their own Twitter accounts, which please don't do, they need to disclose their employees. If you're tweeting something or retweeting something from your account, you need to make sure that the information is accurate and that there aren't any issues with advertising kind of laws. Isn't a huge deal. This isn't something that you need to stay up night worrying about. I just want you to be aware of it. Then we get to think about unprofessional versus unethical and illegal. This is the only slide I have about this because there's not a whole heck of a lot of really great examples that are concrete. But when you're building a social media policy and when you're thinking about social media in your organization, what are you gonna care about? Is it only things that are illegal or unethical? Or is it also things that are unprofessional? Now here's the fun part. Some fun examples of how people have done it wrong. This is a dog and he's disappointed in everyone. I love this dog. He's not my dog, but he could be. This is a tweet. This is a physician who tweeted verbatim. So I have a patient who has chosen to either no-show or be late, sometimes hours, for all of her prenatal visits, ultrasounds, and NSTs. She's now three hours late for her induction. May I show up late to her deliver? This doctor lost her job. She was talking about a patient who could under certain circumstances be identified from just the information this doctor had public in her Facebook account. Not a good use. She defended it as just being kind of a gripe and saying there was no PHI until you found out that she's in a relatively small town. And that relatively small town knew who this woman was. To the point where this got posted and 30 minutes later the pregnant woman knew it was up there and was angry. So this is a black and white picture, and all of these have now been approved out here. They're settled, they're on kind of the ether. These pictures are totally okay for me to use. I'm putting that out there because you would think they're bad because they're examples of bad, but doing it wrong. Four nursing students were expelled for taking a picture with a placenta. One, as a non-medical professional, gross. <laughs> Two, you don't get to do that. Um, it's probably not illegal. In fact, it probably doesn't violate HIPAA since nobody can identify the patient by this placenta, we're hoping. But it's not a good idea. This is a really small picture. This was Instagram. A woman took a picture of the emergency room what it looked like after the patient went up to surgery. She then tagged it with man versus six train. The six train is the train that goes basically down the middle of Manhattan. This was all over the news. Everyone knew that a guy got hit by the six train. His name was in the news. He's now been identified. She has now put his information out there for the world. What hospital is he at? He's in surgery. What kind of injuries did he have? This one Instagram gave it all away. This looks relatively innocuous. This is a food fight at a hospital. What you don't know is this hospital had been cited four days before for losing 1,200 patients for inadequate nursing care. This food fight was just an example of how they're not taking care of their patients. This food fight both got those two and four others fired. <sighs> this is a fun one. So this woman sued the doctor and the hospital for posting photos of her drunk in the ER to Facebook. 
she was drinking and the bar just happened to be across the street from the emergency room in Chicago and she literally stumbled in. Whatever doctor that was that saw her and treated her thought it was appropriate to take a picture of her passed out with an IV in her arm, looking like a drunk 20-something, which she was. However, that's not okay. You're not allowed to do that. I'm not sure necessarily why she came forward and wanted to be on the news more, but she did. That doctor got fired. I think they paid her something like $1.3 million uh, to go away because you cannot do that. Make good choices. Yeah, doesn't that look like it hurts a lot? So this person, her name is Catherine Knott, and this was a huge deal. Um, if you Google her name, you're going to find out kind of that she's a horrible person. But this is just one example. And she wrote on her Twitter, I got to pop this back in. Are you super jelly? Which is uh, teenagers speak for, are you jealous? That, before I edited it, had the patient's name on it. It all of, had all of the identifying information on it. Duh. Don't do that. Do not post x-rays online. She also went on a, several racist tirades on her Twitter and thought that that was okay and you could still keep your job. You don't get to. Doing it right. So now we've seen some examples of really, really bad decisions. Let's see what it looks like to actually do it the right way. The Navy and Marine Corps. Relief Society, they have their patients follow them on Facebook. The nurses that they follow watch and read their updates. They've prevented at least 12 suicides this way. Because when they start posting things about being depressed, PTSD, kind of warning signs, these nurses call them, they reach out and they say, what can we do? You are cared for, we care for you. How can we help you? 12 people have said, if it weren't for that, I wouldn't be here today. That's the right way to use social media. I just got goosebumps. The UMMS has a liver transport support group. So their head nurse wrote on here, reminder for all of you post-transport plant patients, when you get immunized for flu this year, make sure you get the shot, not the nasal spray. Have you gotten it yet? Perfectly generic. I took the top comment. There were a bunch of comments on this group in general. People are commenting, this is great information. Thank you. I didn't know I needed the shot. I got my shot, yada, yada, yada. Boom, you're providing a service. You're not violating any sort of laws. And you're actually helping patients. This one I like as well. So hospitals, some hospitals have decided that instead of taking all of the time it would take to individually necessarily train on bike helmet safety for little kids. Here's a YouTube video. It's a YouTube video. It's going to teach you everything to know about choosing a bike helmet, fitting a bike helmet, and how to be most safe when wearing the bike helmet. It is a little less personal, but it frees up the staff to actually treat more patients and still provides the proper information to the patients. It's policy time. When writing your policies, there's no thing as one size fits all. Do not copy and paste from someone else's policy. That means you're doing it wrong. Every single organization is going to have a different policy, and you should. That doesn't mean that there aren't good examples, but it means you have to at least read it and try to see what fits for you. Mayo Clinic, another really good example of policies. Intel, Coca-Cola, they have great social media policies. Don't be vague. This is the killer when the NRRB is concerned. Do not be vague. Provide actual examples. Take my slides and say, this is OK, this is not OK. That's what you're going to want to see if you're going to protect yourself from NLRIB issues. You can't say, do not post on Facebook about this organization. The NLRB, NLRB is going to get you. If you say you cannot post defamatory information and you cannot post any protected health information for any one of our patients, here's some examples of what not to do. You're gonna be much, much safer. 
Remember, you cannot control social media, but you can manage it. If you try to control it, it's going to struggle, it's going to get out, and it's going to be a bad time. You can manage it. Also, consider two policies. So if you have social media as for your organization, and you have certain people who are supposed to handle that social media, they need a different policy than everyone else. These people are on social media all day. They need a different policy than the people who are supposed to be on social media on their breaks and at lunch. Consider having a separate policy for each. Avoid the three Ds. Disclosure, discrimination, defamation. If you remember nothing else, remember, avoid the three Ds. And expect and plan for a crisis. It's gonna happen. There's gonna be some point when something goes horribly wrong and you're gonna to wanna to know how you're going to react before you have to react. If you have a crisis team, if you have people who you know that you've designated beforehand are in charge of making the decisions and acting on what happens on social media, that is a good idea. You're going to have a crisis. It may not be a big one, but it's gonna happen. Using social media to promote your compliance program. Now that we know everything there is to know about social media, how do we use it for our advantage? Watch and listen. This is sign language. Watch and listen. If you're not comfortable with social media, if it's new to you and new to your organization, step back. Watch what's going on. Listen to what your peers are saying. Listen to what patients are saying. Listen to what the people you want to reach are saying on social media. That is the best indicator of what you should be doing. Post. I really like acronyms. People, what are people looking for? What is the niche you can fill? Are people wanting to know where your policies are? Are they looking for general compliance information? Do they have questions? Do they want reporting? Where's your hotline? If the people that you're trying to reach are looking for these things, that's what you need to provide them on social media. Objectives, what are your goals? Why are you getting on social media? Don't get into it just to get into it. Have a goal. We want to promote our compliance program. We want to reach 50% of our organization through our social media channels. We want to build engagement for corporate compliance and ethics week, plug. We want to make sure everyone knows about our training on Tuesday. These are your goals. Have them. Have objectives. Because without them, you can't measure anything. Strategy. You want to think about how do you want your relationship with others to change through social media? Do you want them to view you as more friendly, more approachable? Do, they want, do, they, do you want them to view you and your compliance program as open and honest? How do you want this relationship to change? And technology. What social media channels do you want to use and why? Facebook's great. Do you want to be on Facebook? Twitter. Is it going to be any benefit to anyone if you start a Twitter account? These are things to think of. Where do your people live? And I don't mean physically, I mean on the internet. Where are the people that you're trying to reach with your compliance program online? Are they all on Facebook? Are they all on Twitter? Are they pinning their hearts out because they're planning weddings and having craft sessions? Are they on Instagram? Well, if they're 25 and under, they probably are. Or are they on LinkedIn? Because they're all busy professionals who only have time for one social media channel. Become a trusted resource. The most important thing to do it professionally, to do social media professionally, is to add value, information, and guidance. If you're not adding value, you're adding noise. No one likes noise. Oh, go back. Be helpful, honest, and engaging. One of the things I'm always telling Roy, our CEO, is to be authentic. He thinks people would think he was too weird or unprofessional if he says some stuff that he wants to say. And I'm always telling him, be authentic. 
One, because it's easy to be who you are. And two, because people connect. I talk too fast and I walk around awkwardly when I'm presenting, but that's who I am and I'm being authentic and hopefully that gives me trust and that builds rapport. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Interact with your community and audience. That's Andy Sandberg giving some sort of animal a high five. I'm a big fan of high fives. If you came by the booth, I hope I gave you a high five. Interact with them. Don't just post things and let it sit. If someone comments or has a question, comment back, answer that question. It's a conversation. It's not a one-way street. And use several platforms. So if you're gonna go on social media, pick three. You can do more, but pick at least three. Because if you're only on one, someone's gonna want you to be on the others. There we go. Give your staff, your leadership, and your community a voice. So when you do your training and you have your intranet and maybe you have a lunch every six months to promote your compliance programs, that's what people see. If you get on social media, you're going to give your people a voice. You're going to give them a chance to react with you, to have an ongoing conversation, to keep it going. That's a really good tool, particularly when people are reporting issues. If they feel comfortable with you, if they know that you're out there and you're engaging, they're gonna feel, fear retaliation less and they're gonna be more likely to engage with you to report issues. Humanize your organization. Compliance. Everyone thinks of compliance as the police. You're the bad guys. Legal thinks you're the people who stop them from having all the fun. <laughs> it is a really good way to humanize your organization. Put your picture up there. Kim, up front here, always smiling. If you put Kim on any social media, everyone's gonna go, wow, that is so friendly. Kim's always smiling. She's really approachable. I know I can talk to her. Make a connection. Share interesting and relevant information or your ice cream cone with your doc. What's gonna keep people coming back to your social media is that you're sharing information they want, care about, and need. Share, share, share. Give, 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 ask. Give them the information. Give them all of the resources they need. Ask that they trust you and that they report issues if they find them. Solve problems. Social media is a great problem solving tool because people are gonna post issues on social media because they feel safe. Solve their problems. Hey, guess what? There is an unlocked computer station in the ER 90% of the time. Someone tells you that on your Facebook, you see it, you send someone down there and you say, please lock your computer station. There's x-rays left up in a hallway where someone can see them. Boom, someone puts that on Instagram. Send someone down there now. Pull those x-rays down and then gently remind the physician who put them up there about the policies. Solve problems. Make an existing process better. So you've got your hotline. I'm assuming all of you have hotlines. If you don't, I'm sorry to assume that, but your hotline is great. How many people know about it? I'm sure you try to plaster your numbers everywhere you can think of, but people don't see them, they don't know them. They don't know your compliance department number. They also probably don't know your names or your faces. Make the process better by solving the problems, or sorry, make the process better by getting your information out there, getting your helpline number, make it your Facebook banner, make it your Twitter banner, put it on Instagram every day, put it on Pinterest, make it big. Share the importance of a common mission. We're all in this together. It's a group hug. We all just wanna be compliant and ethical. Help us be compliant and ethical. It's a way to get people to do what you want. Answer questions, like I said before. Answer the questions that are asked on your social media. Answer them fast and friendly. Twitter chats are great, yep. So, how would you um, isolate talking to the workforce, which is what you were mm -hmm. going over, which you don't necessarily want to have 
in public facing. And then the corporation or the hospital or clinic would have, I want to talk to the world about how cool we are. Exactly. A great way to do that. Did everyone hear his question? He said, how do you isolate your workforce? How do you say, everyone who just, I want to care about compliance in this specific organization. You're the only people I'm talking to. I am not talking to Joan in Alabama who's posting pictures of her dog. What you can do is on Facebook and most of these sites, create private groups. You can create a private group. You can either do it by asking people to join or you can do it via email. You create a private group and send an email to everyone in your organization as an invitation. Only people with these email addresses get to be in this group. Nobody sees it except those in your organization. So it'd be wrong to think that a compliance person would be an authoritarian. Could you force people to join? To no. say, here's my private group on Facebook and you're in it. No, you can't. You cannot force anyone to join social media. You cannot force them to give you your passwords. You cannot force them to post anything. So social media has to be completely voluntary. It's a really good question. So please don't force anyone to join social media because then if they get mad, they're gonna get, you're going to get in trouble. Okay, I got one more follow-up. Yeah. I'm done on that. So is there a way that that, that private group could be penetrated or bleed into the other? Can things be forwarded from them? Can they be, you know, do they show to someone, if I like someone, something on my private group, is that gonna show up over here that in my public you can You can put it over there if you choose. So if you go, oh, this is really great, send it to the person who's in charge of the public group and they can post it. They can link back to it. They can take screenshots. It's not going to do it automatically. If your group is shut down, it's shut down. Thank you very yep. much. Yep. Question? Um, it seems like you would have to have rules about not posting patient information and things like that. Yes. If you're going to open up something like this. Absolutely. So that's your social media policy. So look to the Mayo Clinic. Google Mayo Clinic social media policy. I've got the links in here as well. It's not going to do you much good when you're looking at it. They have an amazing social media policy that lets them post what they need and want to post, but still protects all of their patients and their private data. So that's all going to be in your social media policy. She asked about when people are posting, say, don't post private information. Your policy that you build about social media is going to be what protects you from that. And I will throw this out there. We're not quite done yet, but if, and I'm going to take more questions. But if you have questions about building a social media policy, email me. Let me know. I will help you. I will send you examples. I'm not going to write your policy because I don't have time to do that. But I will definitely get you on the path to good policies. Question, sir? Statement. Private yes. Yes, that is a very true statement. So private groups, if people think that they are in a private group, people will start sharing information that they shouldn't. From a compliance perspective, so we're talking compliance perspective, your private group open to your entire organization, you're going to want to put everywhere in big font, don't share any information here. This is about the compliance program. Here's our number. Here's an email address. Do not put patient information on this website. These are not ways to report necessarily as a comment on Facebook. It's a way to show people where they can. Thank you for bringing that up. Yep. This is such a generic answer. 
It's going to be through your policy again. So you're going to have to have, if that's the kind of thing happening in your organization, you're going to have a really, really tight policy. The question was, private groups start about scheduling. So scheduling is going to be one of the things the NLRB is going to say, you got to let them talk about it. But it gets to scheduling. Thursday afternoon, this, this, this patient. I'm doing all of my handoffs now in this private group instead of doing them in person. Your policy needs to be able to cover that. And the simplest way to do that is don't talk about patient information. Do not put it on there. You are going to have to monitor it. You can't control it, but you can monitor it. Your policies are going to be the key for this, for enforceability. You can ask them not to post, but the policies are going to be the key. <laughs> Take it down. So whom, whomever is controlling the group, hopefully it's a trusted employee, uh, a, an employee who makes good decisions, email them and say, this got posted in your group. It needs to come down now. It needs to come down 10 minutes before it was posted. I want it done now. I don't want any ifs, ands, or buts about it. Here's the piece of the policy that says why it needs to come down. That's going to get into um, kind of the breach notification and awareness side of things. So if someone posts information on one of these private groups and PHI, and then that client or patient finds out about it and comes back and says, nah, -uh, I got a mortgage to pay. I'd like you to pay it now. Um, that's going to get into your breach notification policies and the breach notification rules that come from CMS. Uh, Frank Corellis, who's not here, is a really, really good resource on that uh, as far as determining what kind of breach and the kind of math you need to do on the underside to determine what to do to make the person whose information was breached happy. Not necessarily happy, but whole again. So I will say, social media is not without risks. But I think personally, and many, many of the big organizations out there agree with me, that some of the rewards outweigh the risks. People want to make good decisions. The people posting on Facebook, as long as it's not egregious, are doing it because of ignorance, not because of malice. So when you put your policies in place, when you train on your policies, and when you put on every single page of every single social media site you have, do not post patient information. Do not post patient information. Do not post anything you want to be kept confidential here. Here are all the ways you can post those things somewhere else. People want to make good decisions. In our, I believe people want to make good decisions. But I am definitely not going to discount the fact there are risks. You got to have tight policies and you got to have monitoring. When something goes up that shouldn't, it needs to come down like that. Yeah, you can post anything you want. That disclaimer is going to be fine until something bad happens, in which case it's not worth the paper it's written on, um, it's not worth anything. So, and legal will tell you the same thing. They'll say, oh, you had a disclaimer. Well, they shouldn't have, couldn't have, wouldn't have. In fact, you put a disclaimer up means you knew they were gonna, or they might. <laughs> so, you can put a disclaimer up, but the better way is to be proactive. Train, give them the information they need. Teach them to make good decisions, so over here, they make good decisions. Question. Yeah, but I had a situation where you have an employee and you hear that something was posted on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just say a picture of the AP. Okay. But then you go to find it, you can't find it anywhere. The person who's recording it doesn't have a picture. You go to that Instagram account, it's been closed down. You know, you find things in the Instagram account though that says things like I work with crazy, hashtag I work with crazy people and I didn't give help. So there's some suspicion of pets that are posted, but you can't find it. 
Okay. So the question was, if someone posts a picture of a patient on Instagram, someone else reports it, nobody can find the picture anywhere. That Instagram is closed down, you can't see anything, but someone used the hashtag, this person used the hashtag, I worked with crazy people, because it's behavioral health. Chances are, there's not a heck of a lot you can do. Unless the patient finds it and reports it, or a government organization finds it and reports it, you don't have proof it happened. You can talk to the person, um, you can show them your policy, but there's not a heck of a lot you can do on the enforcement side without actually seeing it. Obviously, talk to legal if it's something that you want to pursue, but the best bet in that situation is to talk to the person who supposedly uh, posted it and say, hey, we had a potential HIPAA violation here just want to give you another copy of this policy. Just want you to be very aware that this is not how we operate. You cannot, even on your personal site, post any patient information at all, ever, under any circumstances. So, any more questions? I'm gonna skip through Twitter chats because I don't think they're gonna be helpful to this group. All of this, is online. This is our compliance videos. If you want to just start a YouTube, have basically no interaction, just post videos with no ability to comment on them, you can do that. So if you make videos for your compliance program and you just want them out there, so they're not only on your internet, you want them in the universe, YouTube's the way to do that. I have to click through all of these separately because I added a bunch of cool animation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to follow the compliance videos. And one thing that I noticed for this year is that I had to set up a Google Plus account. It wouldn't allow me to set up the account through YouTube on everything yep. in place. So they make you set up a Google account now, not a Google Plus account, thank goodness. So now they changed it like three weeks ago. Okay, you have to set up a Google, there has to be a Google email tied with YouTube because Google owns YouTube. So if you have a Gmail, set up a Gmail, compliance program at nordrumhealthhospital.org, whatever, um, to create a YouTube account. They are gonna require that Google email. Facebook groups, we talked about Facebook groups before. Great way to post pictures. Here's our compliance training, everyone's doing a thumbs up, we all got trained, woohoo! Here's all of us out eating lunch. Here's our new posters for compliance. Here's the desk of our new compliance officer. Here's Kim eating lunch with people who had compliance questions. Human eyes. It's a way to get people to see your face, take pictures, and relate to you on a human level. It's also very easy to maintain. This is the Mayo Clinic's Pinterest. If you do nothing, after this, except go and find the Mayo Clinic's Pinterest, I think I've won because it's really cool. It's a really good example of how to share information for patients without putting yourself at risk. Let me click through all these guys. Oh, you can run Instagram contests. So this is something we do here. <coughs> Running an Instagram contest during Corporate Compliance and Ethics Week saying, if you find every poster we put out there for Corporate Compliance and Ethics Week and take a selfie with it, use the hashtag compliance, name of your organization, we're gonna give you a gift card to Applebee's or whatever. Run and make it fun. Give them an incentive to go throughout the building and find all the compliance posters. Find all the places your hotline is posted. To go and find the compliance officer. Take a selfie with our compliance officer. Hashtag it. Every single picture that we get is an entry to win X, Y, whatever. You're not putting a lot of risk out there. We're hoping people are taking pictures where there's not patients and all of that. But it's a way to get people to interact. It's fun and it's easy. Podcasts. Anyone listen to podcasts? Podcasts are a great way to get information out and not necessarily have to worry about risk coming in. So this is what they call the Peedcast. Dr. Gigi Twala 
from children's hospitals in Minnesota, again, I'm from Minnesota, I'm just picking examples that I knew about, does a PED cast every week. Here, here are the big things we're seeing in PEDs. Here are some questions that people are asking. Here's what research looks like for the future. Really good way to establish yourself as an authority, get some credibility, and also not a lot of risk. And the final one, I think it's the final one, is a blog. You can start a compliance blog. Kathleen Edmond of Best Buy, she was the chief compliance officer for Best Buy. She now works for Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Cerisi in Minnesota. Started a blog about their compliance program. She was the compliance officer, so she knew what she could and couldn't write about. And she wrote about the challenges and the issues that they were having internally. She made it public. She let anyone read it because she said these are the issues every compliance office has. These are the issues we're all facing. Let's put it out there. It's not secret. Let's share our troubles. It built credibility in her Best Buy organization by a thousand. Everybody said, you know what? She's being completely transparent. She's not hiding. She's being upfront about the issues they have, but she's also telling us what she's doing to fix it. It was a great way. She got a little bit kind of compliance famous for doing it, but it's a great example of how she used her office to connect with people. Just clicking through these. All of these slides are on our website. You can email me if you want them as well. These are some additional resources. So Mayo Clinic has what they call the Social Media Health Network. They teach you how to use social media as a health organization. I am not at all affiliated with Mayo Clinic. They have not paid me to tell you anything about them. They don't even know I'm telling you about them. Um, but I am a big fan of what they're doing on social media. And they're big. So you talk about having to monitor employees, try monitoring 300,000 employees on social media. The Healthcare Hashtag Project. Again, a really good example of how to use social media to benefit your organization. HCCA Net. Plug for our own social media site. Again, that's where your peers can go ask questions. It's not confidential. I will tell you, do not post confidential information. If you have a question that you won't want posted confidentially, email me. We can post and say a confidential person would like this question answered. We will completely take out all any sensitive information and then I will email you directly the responses. I'm not gonna breach your confidentiality and that's not because I don't have to, but because I'm not going to and because I don't want to. And that's it. Do we have any more questions? How many of you are gonna now go find me on LinkedIn? So I have cards out at the registration desk. I'm going to be out there till probably two. Oh, yep, go ahead. Uh, Vimeo. Yes. Do, make a comment? Do I make a comment on video? Could you, could you make a comment on that? Using it? YouTube, yes. Vimeo is cool and hip. It's also shorter. That's why I chose it, because it was cool and hip. It's cool and hip. So is Vine. Vine is very much the same. So those are great. You're gonna reach a lot younger audience. YouTube has a wider berth. YouTube is now, like I said earlier, owned by Google. So when you put something on YouTube, Google's gonna find it. It's all about being found, then you're gonna to wanna to use YouTube. If you wanna get the cool kids and the young hip kids, which I'm not even part of anymore, makes me a little sad, um, <laughs> then Vimeo's where you're gonna go. Vimeo is mostly as an app, though. It's similar to Instagram where if someone's on a desktop computer or a laptop, it's not gonna reach them nearly as well as YouTube is. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? All right, oh, one more, one more. I just got a, a, one, of the, one of the situations that we're battling in our organization is we had a resident who went to a public event. Mm -hmm. An employee was off duty, took a selfie, and posted on Facebook. Okay. Um, no really identifying factors, you know, that's out there that links those two with our organization. Mm -hmm. um, 
What are your thoughts around, around that? My thoughts are they can do that. Um, not legal advice. Just my gut reaction is the from knowing what the NLRB has said and knowing kind of the bounds, they're going to be able probably to do that. As long as no improper, improper information was disclosed, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it. You can write policies around it, but that's probably going to be okay. Again, I'm not giving you advice saying it is okay. Check with legal, check with your own lawyers. Well, but Yep. Yes. So, oh, one more. Yeah. So that's uh, going to be a similar situation. We had a situation where a employee reposted a picture, similar situation where this employee was friends with a patient. The patient, uh, the mother took a picture of this nurse with the patient, posted on her Facebook site, and the nurse then reshared it and posted it on. Was there permission at the beginning? Uh, so, the, the mother of the patient took the picture. So, yes. so we're assuming that since the mother of the patient was able to share it, that there was some sort of, however, you didn't get necessarily get permission on your side, so that's a sticky situation. And this is a cop-out I'm going to tell you to ask legal. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, as a lawyer, I could tell you what I think, but I'm not going to, because you have legal for that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and her sister was very comfortable with the social media, so the sister started an account and started connecting with LinkedIn with all of the executives at our facility and started going through and connecting also with middle management. And it was hard to figure out what was going on, but everyone was getting this connection. And so I ended up tracking the person down only because I knew what the sister did and the last name. and so. We didn't know what to do, but I ended up having a one-off meeting with that person saying, this has to stop. Really? Yes. People went LinkedIn crazy. Yes. Well, it's also on all of the people in your organization to only accept people on LinkedIn who they know right. and or who they have some sort of relationship with. So attendees I always accept because you guys are awesome. Um, and I take it as a compliment if someone wants to see what I have to say on LinkedIn, which isn't terribly interesting, I'll be honest. But um, it, it's, that, would, that part I would enforce from the other side, quite honestly. You said someone not at all part of the organization started friending all of the managers and middle managers. That I would take from the other side and tell the managers and middle managers that they need to be careful who they're friending and linking in with. Anyone can send a request. They need to be good decision makers and know who to accept, who not to accept. So, well, thank you all for being a great audience. Enjoy the last day.